And good morning. I'm delighted to be here with you. Often I get to be here with you when you're on the cusp of something exciting. So just know that I hold you in my heart as you complete the voting for your next minister. And I hold you in my heart as you continue with your new minister. It's, it's a wonderful time and I'm grateful to be able to be here with you. Um, it's, it's an interesting time because I'm wrapping up a theme and I know some of the weeks of this month you've had talks on the theme, we are inclusivity in action. And I think some of the weeks you didn't, is that right? When uh, Sid Sydney and Robert, oh, just one week. So I'm wrapping up something that, I don't know which quotes they used, which points they used, but I, um, did one of the talks in this series uh, the other week. So I'm just gonna pull from it what I liked and hopefully that'll wrap it up. Um, so it is this inclusivity in action. And actually today we are going to present to you a community statement, which we're not gonna put up yet, um, that the board has approved. It is something that the centers organization put together to give us something to anchor this theme around. So that's what I'll be talking about in a bit. But first, I wanted to talk about why did they do this theme? Number one, somebody was catching a vision because it has been so timely and appropriate this month to be talking about this. I mean, can you imagine they did this, created this last year? It, it just boggles my mind. It's time, and as we look at the statement, some of it may seem daunting, and yet I know that we incarnated for a time such as this. There's a reason that we're all on the planet right now while this pandemic, while Black Lives Matter is raising itself up. There's a reason we're all here. And there's a reason we're at this center in this teaching because I think we all have a part to play. Um, Marshall Rosenberg, one of the quotes for this series said, our survival as a species depends on our ability to recognize that our well-being and the well-being of others are in fact one and the same. We've heard this before. Marshall Rosenberg is um, the one who started nonviolent communication. But it's we are inextricably linked to each other. It is something that we in this teaching teach. But it's really time that everyone in the world catches on to this. Um, it is time that we more deeply manifest the expression of oneness. That is what we teach. It is time that we more deeply express that, that we see it manifested. As Ernest Holmes says, it seems to me that it is only as we view all life, everything from what we call great, to what we call small, important or unimportant. It is only as we view the whole thing as one stupendous whole, whose body nature is with God the soul. It is only that we view the whole thing as one whole, that we shall really enter into communion, into sympathetic oneness and rapport with the reality of all that is about us. Oneness is what we teach. It is the first principle that we teach in science of mind, that there is only one. And so it is time we took the next steps. And here's the thing. I think David Alexander might have said this in one of the articles that he writes after Ernest Holmes in the Science of Mind magazine is, and maybe, maybe it was Jesse Jennings, but they said, 
one of the things that we teach is when we really start praying or doing affirmative prayer for something that we really want, everything unlike what we've said we want starts to show up. And we think we may think we're being punished or it's not happening, but what our teachers tell us is that everything unlike that which we have been praying for comes up to be healed. It comes up so we see it. So if we have been praying and visioning for a world that works for everyone, it is no accident that we are now truly seeing more than ever before, certainly more than we may have wanted to see how it's not. So we need to do this inclusivity in action because we're in the midst of seeing what truly needs to be healed on our planet. So we're right on time, right on time. So as I said, this community statement was created and the community statement, the purpose of it is to help us reveal the beloved community. And I was trying to remember who coined that because um, I'd heard Reverend Michael Beckwith refer to it a lot. And it turns out it was Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he may not have coined it actually, but he brought it into parlance. And it's basically a global vision of a society based on justice, equal opportunity, and love of one's fellow human beings. And I like this thing that his, his wife, Coretta Scott King spoke. Poverty, homelessness, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. In other words, creating the beloved community means that we come to a place where what we're seeing right now cannot happen because we have all raised the bar on what is acceptable on our planet. We have done it with other things and now it's time to really do it with diversity of all kinds. So this statement is something that becomes a North Star, something that we can have out front to connect to. It gives us a framework to be more inclusive in both our relationships and in the communities we create. And as you know, what we intend, what we put our intention on, what we vision, what we focus on, is what we can manifest. So that is the purpose of this statement. And what we claim matters. Each of us matter. What we put our individual attention on matters in the collective. Now, when, you, when we talk about this statement, um, and again, I say thank you, because I'm definitely talking to myself. So I am not talking to you guys as you have to do this, because I have mastered any of this. In fact, as we look at this statement, none of us is gonna be able to do this perfectly. This is about having something to shoot for, a very beautiful high vision to shoot for as this particular community goes forward and as all our Center for Spiritual Living communities go forward and as our planet, I think, go forward. So everybody take a breath. and buckle your seatbelt. So Bobby, if you would put the statement up and I'm gonna read it, then I'm gonna break it down and talk about it, and then I'm gonna have us all read it together. So this is a community statement of inclusion. We Monterey Center for Spiritual Living are a community that celebrates diversity, fosters inclusion, champions inner work, and create space for brave, vulnerable conversations. We are a community that honors the unique emanation of God that each person embodies, that advocates with people for human rights and dignity for all. 
We are a community that blesses each other, sees holiness in all life, remains learners and listeners so that we can grow together and understands that oneness is not sameness. And we, Monterey Center for Spiritual Living, know that the beloved community is revealed when we love each other well. Okay, so let's break this down. And Bobby, if you would put me back on, we'll bring that up again so you can see it. Okay, so the first piece is we are a community that celebrates diversity. So I know you've been talking about this, you've been hearing about this, but the thing that I came to is that the truth is we cannot claim to really know oneness, to express it, if we do not see the diversity around us. If we don't see and recognize and hear the diversity of people, of insights, of colors. One of the wonderful comments in, in one of the, um, in the, first or I think second talk in this series was we many of us with good intentions used to say oh I'm colorblind I don't see color but what that does for the other person is have them not be seen and guess what I want to be seen in all my flaming flaws and uniqueness if you don't if you think, oh, I'm just, you're just the same as me, then I don't feel seen. I don't feel seen. So we celebrate the diversity that we all are when we see it. The second thing is we are to be a community that fosters inclusion. And you know, that's what we've been talking about all month. Did you guys hear get read to the quote by Ralph Waldo Trine, I think it was in last week's, that starts out, and he was a contemporary or right before Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, any idiot can be exclusive. Do you guys remember this? Did you hear this quote? No, I'm saying no. Okay, then I'm gonna read it to you because it's so great. Anyone, a fool or idiot can be exclusive. It comes easy. And he's writing this in the 1800s. It takes and signifies a large nature to be universal, to be inclusive. Only the man or the woman of a small, personal, self-centered, self-seeking nature is exclusive. The man or the woman of a large, royal, unself-centered nature never is. The other loves all the world, but in his larger love for all the world, he finds himself included. So I know that you are not idiots. <laughs> and can you believe this was written so long ago and we are still learning about how to be inclusive? So um, Reverend Dr. Edward Viun had in, uh, I think, his Science of Mind article, he talked about what sign of welcome are we wearing? Are we saying you're welcome to those newcomers that come in our doors and then just ignoring them? Are we seeing, hearing, listening, and connecting? Are we fostering folks who come into our community and communities to feel a sense of belonging and to ask ourselves, what is it that creates a sense of belonging? So be thinking about what creates a sense of belonging for you. It's not just having somebody say, hi, I'm glad you're here. There are other components to how you are invited to participate. 
to whether you can show up as yourself. Whether that seems to be how the other people are being or not, that you can show up how you are and be welcomed and seen and appreciated. Participation, are you able and invited to participate? That is belonging, that is being included. What do you think about this? What would you like to see us do? How could this community be more, more welcoming to you? Participation. Um, one of the thoughts from last week's that Reverend Catherine may or may not have said, or well, really what it was all about is we are better together. A garden with only one color of flower is dull. Wire rope becomes strong as the different strands are threaded together. We are better, we are stronger, we are more flexible when there are lots of us included in our diversity. I was going through old papers this morning and I saw, I know this is very quote heavy, but this was so good. This was from some complete other talk. Plato said, we are born whole, but we need others to be complete. We are born whole, but we need others to be complete. We need other points of view, other ideas, other beliefs to be complete. So we are a community that fosters inclusion, belonging, participation. Okay, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. We are a community that champions the inner work. And I think this was threaded throughout the week. And, you know, really, this is not that odd. If you've taken a class here, you can see that this idea of champion inner work is just for diversity, is just the logical extension of what we already teach. The first classes that we teach have us start to look at how we think. What are we telling ourselves? What are the beliefs, both those that are conscious and those are not, that are governing our life? What are the paradigms that we've been operating out of as if they were the truth of life that is just something we got an idea about when we were little? There's a quote from Schopenhauer, the great philosopher, that activates what I often teach in these beginning classes, that we have our whole belief system set up by the time we're six, seven, eight. We draw conclusions, we hear what our parents say, and we don't go back. If we don't go back and look at them, that's how we operate. And so what we're being asked to do now is not just look at our own beliefs about prosperity, health, loving relationships. Those are really important and those are important to look at and say, where am I limited by beliefs? that I've been holding that aren't really true, where are my biases? Where, that are unconscious, and where have I been unconsciously racist? One of the biggest things for me to come into these conversations has been realizing that being called or referring to myself as a racist doesn't mean I'm bad. It doesn't mean I'm going to join the Ku Klux Klan. No, not at all. It means it's referring to the fact that we swim in a sea of racism. We swim in a system that is racism. We are not bad people. We are just people who've not been conscious of how the system we're living in privileges some of us and disprivileges others of us. So we have to be willing as we go into being more inclusive, as we truly celebrate diversity, to really look and see 
where am I holding someone as less than or holding someone in a different way simply because of the color of their skin, simply because of their education, simply because of their financial situation? Where are my biases? It's okay that I have them. I just need to start becoming aware and see what I really want to continue to hold on to. Without the inner work, we cannot have collective change. Without inner change, we can't have collective change. And you know what? If we don't have this outer change in the world, then none of the inner change really matters. So we're really seeing, this is something Barbara Leger does. She makes that infinity symbol to refer to how each thing feeds another. So as we continue to do our inner work, to see our biases, to heal them, then we affect the collective. And especially as we go on in this and it affects us and we affect it. The fourth statement is we're a community that creates space for brave, vulnerable conversations. And these are by nature, guess what? Uncomfortable. So we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And you know, we talk about that thing called the comfort zone. This is my comfort zone. I'm making a circle here. Guess what? That's not where our growth tends to happen, inside that cute little zone. So we have to venture out. We have to have the conversations and be willing to trip over ourselves, be willing to make mistakes. I had a huge uncomfortable conversation with my um, stepson-in-law who is African-American. I thought I was meaning something and he heard something else. And this was months and months. This was more than a year ago. And he was very offended by stuff I was saying that I thought he understood. I was saying it sarcastically. And his wife came and said, you know, he's totally shut down. And man, my stomach was up to here. I felt like I was about to cry. And then I thought, no, you don't get to cry now. You have to give him the opportunity to tell you how it landed on him. And you don't get to defend yourself. Because this is not about he heard me wrong. This is about there are things that I do not to get as a white person to be sarcastic about. And it took me a long time to get that. At the time, I just thought, well, I'll be quiet. He misunderstood me. But as I started to read some of the books, I'm sure some of you have been reading, I saw, no, no. And that was uncomfortable. And we don't have a close relationship either. So it was really uncomfortable but I'm glad I was willing to do it. And he got to tell me what he needed to tell me. Um, for those of you who want some practice, there's a YouTube series called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And they're wonderful. And actually, he brings up uncomfortable things, but he himself does not make it uncomfortable. I don't think so. It could be more uncomfortable, but I'm going to invite you to find that on YouTube, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, and start seeing this and start stepping into this and start understanding what our brave, vulnerable conversations can look like. Okay. I turned my paper over. That's how many things there are. So number five is we are a community that honors the unique emanation of God that each person embodies. 
We are a community that honors the unique emanation of God that each person embodies. Well, we know this when we sing, the God in me beholds the God in you, namaste. So we say it, but this is calling us to really live it and see where we're not. You know, it occurred to me, and maybe it's occurred to all of you, that in the first chapter of the Hebrew scriptures, that we were created in the image and likeness of God. You know, that was, and you know, I'm, I'm preaching to a choir here, I recognize that, but it just occurred to me, that was not written by Caucasians. And I think there, that there's a bunch of Caucasians who think that the image and likeness of God, if you've seen many of the paintings of Jesus, you know, it just, no, it was actually Semitic people. And so we're all in the image and likeness of God. It's a much bigger universal thing. We need to be willing to see that. Can you see the homeless person begging on the corner? Don't see that too much in Pacific Grove or Monterey. Um, definitely see it in the streets of downtown Seattle. And having been there last week, when uh, my husband's son was visiting, we saw quite a bit. Can I see that person as the image and likeness of God? Can I be present for just a moment with that person and saying, in that, we are one? The next one, and this can be a little tricky for those of us who've been in this movement for a while. We're a community that advocates with people for human rights and dignity for all. That advocates with people for human rights and dignity for all. And here's the thing, this is not political. This is ethical. This is moral. This isn't about party lines. This is about what is the world that we want to see human rights and dignities for all with no one and nothing left out. So there are organizations you can find out about, there's books you can read, there's ways to get yourself lifted. Um, wanted to throw in, and uh, while we're on this section, is I saw I think that was so helpful in understanding equity versus equality. That equ there showed these, these three kids of different heights uh, standing in front of a fence. The other side of the fence was a baseball game. And so equality is giving them all a box, the same box to stand on. And the kids were all different heights. So for one kid, that box was sufficient. He could see the baseball game. But for the other two kids, it wasn't. Same box didn't work for everybody. Equity is letting each person, helping each person to have the box that's the right size so they can see the game. Everybody deserves to have that equity to create a society where we figure out, with all our differing opinions about it, to figure out how to extend that equity figure it out. And we do need all points of view. Um, of the, the young man who was shot in Wisconsin, I kept seeing his sister speak. And I don't know if any of you saw that. She was amazing. She was amazing. She said, when you speak of him, say brother, father, cousin, different relationships he had. She said, most important, say human, say human. Because there's a lot of stuff going down right now that seems like there's a lot of folks that don't think certain folks are human. That's not how they're being treated. Trevor Noah said, even when people are with a dangerous animal, they shoot it in the leg to wound it to slow it down, they don't shoot it seven times in the back. Okay, I'm done, I know that was big, that was rough, but 
you know, if we're not willing to see some of the rough stuff, we are not going to be the collective force for love and good that we need to be to see dignity. She said, I don't want, I, I want to say one more thing. She said, I don't want pity. I don't need your pity. I want change. I want change. So as we take this breath for all this big stuff that's hard to hear and hard to be with, it's hard for me to be with. It's hard for me to think what is mine to do. To remember that we are a community that blesses each other. That we know that we have the capacity through how we be with each other to bless each other. And to bless, one definition I heard of, means to confer prosperity upon. It means to wish good for the other. And we can all do that. You don't have to be some ordained something or other to bless. You can bless in your mind, you can bless with your presence. Barbara Brown Taylor said this, anyone can ask and anyone can bless, whether anyone has authorized you to do it or not. All I am saying is that the world needs you to do this because there is a real shortage of people willing to kneel where they are and recognize the holiness holding it sometimes bony, often tender, always life-giving hand above their heads that we are willing to bless one another is miracle enough to stagger the very stars that we can bless one another and know that we wish good for everyone. And kind of the corollary to that is we are a community that sees holiness in all life. I'm taking a wonderful class now that I got from something called the Shift Network uh, that's actually being taught by, I thought she was, she's a, a religious science minister, and it's called Spiritual Allyship, uh, which is really wonderful. And she said in class, you know, versus seeing the holiness in all life, she said, the climate devastation and the institutional racism, those are all part of the same consciousness. It's the same problematic consciousness that one group of people thinks they get to use everything for their own benefit, everything and everyone for their own benefit. It's all a part of the same issue. So we need to see the holiness in each other, the sacredness in each other, the sacredness of our planet, the sacredness of the creatures that live on it. We are a community that sees the holiness of all life. And here's Denise Kaku's favorite. We are a community that remains listeners and learners so that we can grow together. We remain listeners and learners. We don't say, okay, too much, didn't sign up for this. No, we listen, we open, we look within, and we grow together. We have each other to support each other when it gets hard. And there are books and there are classes and there are conversations to keep us listening, learning, and growing. The next one, we're almost done. <laughs> the next one is we are a community that understands oneness does not equal sameness. Ernest Holmes said, unity does not mean uniformity. We are not all the same. We have different opinions. And again, the garden would be so dull if there were only one kind of plant in it. We need them all to know our oneness does not mean that we move in lockstep, that we become a Stepford community. Remember the days, the old days, some of you have been around for a long time, that if people were ill, they felt like they couldn't show up to church because somehow 
they had brought it on themselves, it's like, whoa, that's not a safe, growing, loving space. That we are, our oneness, our unity does not mean, even though we love to say we're of like mind, that our unity means we can hold each other in love even where we differ. And finally, we're a community that knows that beloved community, that vision of Martin Luther King, that beloved community is revealed when we love each other well. None of this inclusivity in action can happen if we're pointing fingers, if we're being strident, if we're being punitive. We're all in this together. We're all trying to figure it out together. We're all trying to be more inclusive, to know our oneness together. And we're gonna do it in different ways. We're, we're gonna trip, we're gonna fall, we're gonna land flat on our face, cause I sure have. So um, if you're willing, and I'd like to invite you to step into that discomfort and be willing to read it with me. Bobby, if you would put it up. It was there, okay. All right. We, Monterey Center for Spiritual Living, are a community that celebrates diversity, fosters inclusion, champions inner work, and create space for brave, vulnerable conversations. We are a community that honors the unique emanation of God that each person embodies, advocates with people for human rights and dignity for all. We are a community that blesses each other, sees holiness in all life, remains learners and listeners so that we can grow together and understands that oneness is not sameness. And we, Monterey Center for Spiritual Living, know that the beloved community is revealed when we love each other well. And when we do that, beloveds, when we create this beloved community, when we strive, even each step we take, to create it, the beloved community in Monterey Center and a beloved community for our nation and our world, that we are bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come. We are bringing it to earth. And as I was contemplating this this morning, that I think that's our fulfilling, our purpose as a humanity. Humanity's purpose is to recognize the divine and bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. So thank you for trying it on. Thank you for being willing to listen. Let's pray. <sighs> so as I breathe into what has been spoken, I know that the love of God is greater than any difficulties that we have, that the love of God is greater than any division. It is greater than any challenge. It is greater than any inequity. It is greater than any struggle we may face. The love of God everywhere present, right here, right now, closer than hands and feet. And so I speak my word that for each of us, being one with this infinite love, that as we speak and entertain these statements of community, that we are opening ourselves up to that influx of love, to be that greater love that can take a stand for a greater, more inclusive, community, society, world, 
that we truly begin by our love and by our willingness to look and see, to dismantle systems that have kept certain groups lower, certain groups higher, that we begin to see them and dismantle them, not from a place of punishment, from a place of recognizing that this simply can no longer stand, that we as humans must evolve and are evolving to a place where this is not okay. That that greater love requires us to celebrate the diversity in our brothers and sisters and animals and planet and take our steps to be lifting and loving and growing. I know that I cannot do this by myself. I know that none of us can do it by ourselves and none of us can even do it just as humans. It is the God within, with its power, its majesty, its love, its glory, its wisdom, its intelligence, its peace, its harmony, its order. With that welling up, we begin to see and move toward this vision of a world that truly does work for everyone with nothing and no one left out. We vision it, we see it in our own beautiful, individual, colorful minds. We start envisioning that world of peace, of harmony, of joy, of connection and celebration. And as we do that, as we move toward it, as we are guided individually to take the steps that are right for us, as we heal the situations we find ourselves in, that we truly, we truly are doing God's work, which is why we're here. I give thanks for this time. I give thanks for this opportunity to speak into this vision and to know God is present every step of the way. And I release this word in great gratitude of what we are becoming. Thank you, Spirit. And so it is.